Hello and welcome. I'm Ruth Soslowski, the co-chair of the Field Education Committee for Voting is Social Work. I just want to welcome everybody to our Field Education Program for mobilizing the vote. I also want to extend appreciation to the entire committee for their dedication of time in putting this event together. Big shout out to Gary Jones, who's hosting us and handling all the technology. Janice, um, Adriana, Rebecca Sander, Katerina Werner, um, Julie Katz. I want to acknowledge our former chair, Beth Lewis, and the co-chair of our committee, Dr. Kaneko Okudo. Um, special thanks to Mimi Abramovitz, who's um, part of the national leadership and has been incredibly supportive of the Field Education Committee, and she will also be speaking later today, so thank you. Uh, just very briefly, everybody here today appreciates the importance of and challenges regarding civic engagement and democracy. In many states, elections were held just yesterday, including my own state of California, and I know in California, one of the main headlines was the low voter turnout, with many races having less than 20% of eligible voters casting ballots. And in California, this is despite the passage of an assembly bill in 2021 that made voting by mail and in person more accessible and easier than ever. Um, we all understand that it's through voting that our voices are heard. And our hope is that you will leave this program knowing more about the resources available through voting as social work, the power of three campaign, and also be inspired by the specific examples shared by our panel on how to become engaged in the effort to increase voter turnout and raise the voices of those most marginalized. Following the panel presentation, we've set aside time for you to join smaller breakout groups to exchange ideas as you begin to plan how you could start or increase voter registration and voter mobilization at your own programs. Before we get into the panel, we are very pleased and honored to have several guest speakers. First is Julie Katz, who will talk a little bit about NANFED and Kofi. So thank you, Julie. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Cates. I am the field director at Portland State University. And I am also, um, in addition to being the current president of NANFED, uh, I am also a member of the CSWE Council on Field Education. Um, I have my colleague, Melissa, here today, who you will also get to meet. Um, I'm very honored to be here representing NANFED. Um, I was uh, contacted uh, I think it was January of last year, to begin um, visioning together how we could continue to spread the word about the many different facets of the Voting as Social Work uh, campaign and group. And clearly field education, which is a passion of mine, is the perfect arena to reach as many people as possible. Um, NANFED has been a proud sponsor and promoter of voting as social work since 2018, when our board overwhelmingly voted to endorse the mission of the campaign. And we remain committed and continue to believe in the power of social work educators to promote voter mobilization by sharing information through our local and regional consortia and networks. Um, through the vast networks that we have, we are aiming to reach all students, faculty, and field instructors and link them to the rich array of resources available through Voting as Social Work. And today's um, webinar is just another um, tool that will be added to the kit that is already available. And I will just say for myself as a field director, particularly when um, we shifted to fully remote life back in 2020, and I moved quickly to create virtual opportunities for students, um, it was a no-brainer for me to include on, on my sample plans um, opportunities to engage with voting as social work in all of our field sites. So I'm really looking forward to hearing how others have done it in concrete ways, and I welcome everyone, and I'm happy to be joining you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we now have the pleasure of hearing from Melissa Reitmeyer. I apologize if I mispronounced that's, that. That's, to yeah. that's totally okay. I get that all the time. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Melissa Reitmeyer. I'm at the University of South Carolina, but I'm also humbled and honored 
to currently serve as the chair of the Council on Field Education. And we are always excited and supportive uh, in backing our Voting Is Now leadership who are exceptionally amazing, especially now that now is really the time, the important time to really help assist our field programs around the nation on how to mobilize. And not only that, but how to practically and seamlessly get this information into our field instructors' hands um, about the things that they can do to assist and support um, our field instructors and our students um, in activities related to voting. Because at first it may seem simple, uh, but it can pose challenges depending on the areas, the states, and the locations. And one of the things that we really have a charge from from the commission um, which we fall under the Commission on Educational Policy and on the Council on Social Work Education for COFI is to really assist in planning and educating um, our field educators. So that's not just field directors in our programs across the nation, but that's how do you then have that trickle down so that field instructors have it at the time. We're all year round, I know, but a lot of times our biggest launch is a push for August. And so we're really excited uh, to be here, to be supportive of this, and to help share and foster information in any way that we can to get it to many of you as possible. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about with the leadership is that they're recording this call. So if you have folks that have not made it that wanted to, they'll be able to look it back at this and review it. Um, one more plug is, you know, I'm a big fan of the National Voter Registration Act. Many of our field education agencies are in these entities that are required to provide voter motor opportunities. In South Carolina alone, for example, all of our state entities are required to do that. And that's where our students are largely placed. And so there's tons of opportunity uh, to kind of support and educate our field instructors on the way that they can help students bridge the gap from theory to practice um, that you're gonna hear about today which I'm excited as well to hear from our panel and their expertise and hear the innovative ways that they've brought this for today. Without further ado, I'm really actually proud and honored to be able to segue over to Dr. Akuya in that she has been the brainstorm behind all this. So I'm gonna turn it over to her now and welcome her. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutmeyer. My name is Kanako Kuda. And thank you again uh, so much for joining this afternoon. In Mechanical, my, name, my pronouns are she and her, and it's my honor to greet you from Burma College in Burma, Pennsylvania, unceded land of Wolenape people. So I'm delighted to share with you about our community, our group, and its history, and then also some of the campaign. So uh, the field directors group to get to group was initiated by two faculty member, Dr. Mimi Abramovitz and Dr. Terry Mizrahi in fall 2016 semester. Uh, Dr. Abramovitz and Dr. Mizrahi came to my office uh, when I was a director of a field education at Silverman School of Social Work uh, at Hunter College that uh, many, if not majority of the students are not participating in any type of a voter engagement activities in their field practicum. So we thought we had a problem. So now from then we connected to New York, New Jersey and Mid-Atlantic Area Field Directors Consortium. And now here we are. And I would like to again um, give a special shout out to Dr. Beth Lewis, uh, who is our inaugural chair of a field directors group in voting is a social work. And um, also she's my predecessor at Bryn Mawr College uh, Field Education Office. So I would like to talk to you about what we do, the vision of a voting is social work. Social work is a core principle of social work. Social justice is a core principle of social work. It is it calls for ensuring meaningful participation in decision-making by all people. Voting is a social work is a nonpartisan campaign. This is very, very important. 
also it provides all social workers with the knowledge and the tools to raise awareness about the importance of boarding and increase boarding registration and participation. Please advance the slide. So we mobilize. Okay, this is a little smaller. Okay, so by faculty, students, placement agency, and all of us to get together, field director to get together, and clients, student constituents, and then vote and then to vote, especially those um, target by border suppression and uh, gerrymandering laws. We also, um, we also, we integrate civic participation into the classroom and the community and the border registration into the field. And we also provide knowledge to raise awareness and tools to register and to get out the vote. And we stand for social justice, citizen participation, self-determination, social change, and protecting democracy. Please advance the slide. So our campaign is uh, endorsed by more than 25 major social work organizations, including SPEAK, NASW, CSW, NAD, GATE, ACOSA, CRISP, Vote ER, Grand Challenges, Influencing Social Policy, a Special Commission for Advanced Macro Social Work, the Clinical, Latinx, Forensic, Perinatal Social Workers, and many others. Please advance the slide. So I would also like to, endorse, uh, to introduce to you the Power of a Three campaign. So what would it be like if social worker has the power, no, so each of us register at least three people to vote. We sincerely believe that social work has a power to transform democracy. So let's imagine the impact if the 700,000, 700,000 social workers in the United States engage three voters and then they engage another three voters and so on. Please advance the slide. So uh, the power of a three campaign calls to all students faculty and the social workers to mobilize and register at least three people to vote. Um, so here, uh, here are the, uh, the website and we will make sure to have this information available to you. So please join us. So now, I would like, it's my honor to introduce, sincere pleasure to introduce you to our fascinating moderator. Dr. Krista Gilliam, PhD MSW, is a chairperson and associate professor of, school, of social work at Shopping University, State University. She is a fiber artist, mom, and wife that has been advancing the mission of a social work through teaching, serve, and research on topics that promote social, environmental, and economic justice. Through art and research, she explores the experience of African-American women with an emphasis on leadership and mentoring relationship. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Krista. Thank you, Kaneko. Thank you. Thank Love you. It sounds so fancy when you say it. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I am Krista Gilliam, and I'll get the pleasure and honor of being your moderator for this afternoon's presentation. I put in the chat the Voting and Social Work website that um, Kaneko was just talking about, where you can check out a little bit more about the Power of Three campaign. We will definitely talk about it more. You'll hear more about it. But if you want to see what those links will lead you to, um, I did put it in the um, chat. I get the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing one of the um, co 
chairs. I do believe this right, right, Mimi? Mimi is one of the co-chairs for the Voting is Social Work um, campaign. Uh, Mimi Abram, M Abramovitz, I knew I was going to tear it up. I promise I've been practicing. Uh, she's the Bertha Cape and Reynolds Professor of Social Policy at the Silberman School of Social Work in New York. She studies poverty, inequality, and social welfare policy through a lens of race, class, gender, and history, as well as the impacts of incorporating the business model and the human services organization. She has an amazing, fantastic bio. If you've been in a social work program, you have seen and read her work. So without further ado, Mimi. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. And before I start, I just want to um, do a couple of thank yous. First to uh, the CSW organizations, Kofi and Nadfed, for supporting um, voting as social work from the start. You have been, uh, your work and helping us reach the field has been so important. And one of the first things we did was to make field education the hub of our uh, campaigns way back in the beginning, because we knew that's where social workers um, met, met people who needed to be registered. So I just want to acknowledge that, especially since field education doesn't always get the recognition it needs. And we really wanted to make sure that field, rec field education was the centerpiece of our campaign. And it's been that way from the beginning until now. So yes, I am a co-chair of voting is, is social work. Next. We've been around since uh, 2016, as Conoco said, but today voting is more important than ever, as you all know, than ever before. Next. Contrary to prevailing myths, and this is very widespread in the field, that, that many people think that voter registration is not, is, well, the myth is that it's partisan. So what we have to let people know that it is nonpartisan. We do not tell people what candidate or party to vote for. It's real, that stops people from participating in voter registration. Voter registration is professional both NASW and CSWE and many other social work organizations actively support civic engagement and voter registration as we already heard today from a representative Kofi. And uh, it's also possible. I've recently heard that some campuses actually bring uh, voting booths or some way to, for people to vote right onto the campus. So university sponsor it too. The benefits of voting. There are many benefits of voting. One, for individuals. You, you probably know or should know that higher levels of health and mental health, stronger social connections and better employment outcomes and a greater sense of individual efficacy, efficacy come when people actively participate in voting. It's a benefit for communities. Probably know this even more. Communities with higher voter turnout receive more attention, quicker re um, responses, and greater resources from legislators than communities with lower voter turnout. And as benefit for the social work profession, voting elevates social work's visibility and voice. It supports the programs and services that benefit our clients, our workers, and wider society. Next. So, I'm gonna to talk today about threats to democracy because um, I got involved in this campaign because of voter suppression. I had been active in the civil rights movement many years ago and um, when we won voting rights and lived a long time when voting rights were with us. So I got really upset when um, they started taking them away. So I believe that voting is the most basic right in our democracy. It protects democracy, but it was not easy to get here. Next. Social movements played a key role. History tells us that since 1900, the victories of the suffrage, labor, and civil rights movements increased our access to the ballot for women, workers, and persons of color. And those are pictures representing each of the, the suffragists, the civil rights movement, and that's um, Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act with Martin Luther King in front of him. But each time the expansion of voting rights threatened white supremacy, male domination and class power. Those are heavy words, but that's what it was. And, it, and so it, the, the right to vote came under attack. Next. Now this is a lot of history. If you can read it, 
do, but I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna summarize and to save time is to say that there's been a repeated pattern of struggle, progress and backlash. This, so this shows three high points of, of um, uh, struggle and progress. Each one of those was threatened, these gains threatened and challenged white supremacy and they led to a backlash in an effort to restore white supremacy using racial violence, voter suppression, uh, all the way back to the uh, reconstruction period. And this continues today. And I'm gonna go into some more detail about that. Next. So um, again, seeking to preserve white supremacy, the current attack on vote includes voter suppression, this is an intentional effort to design to demoralize the electorate. In, in January, as of January, 2022, more than half the states had introduced more than 250 bills to suppress the vote, up from 75 only a year ago. Election subversion, that term isn't so familiar, but you are seeing a lot of news about how at the states they're trying to interfere with the administration of elections and override the will of the voters. As of March 2022, more than 13 states introduced four bills to subvert, overturn, and undermine elections in these ways. And I think the number is up today. And gerrymandering, the redrawing of maps of election, dis election districts to systematically disenfranchise Black and Latino voters. Our elections are under attack. And then, of course, the January 6th attempted coup. An insurrectionist mob falsely claimed the election was stolen. It stormed the Capitol to stop Congress from counting the electoral college votes. Next. What is the impact of this? Well, basically the impact is that fewer persons of color vote. 2020 was a record voter turnout, largest in 120 years. Yet 71% of white persons, but only 58% of persons of color voted. This racial gap is now worsening or will worsen with the new voter restrictive laws. Next. And we were warned in, in a book called How Democracies Die, two political signs identified four warning signs of democracies in trouble. They include rejecting democratic norms or the rules of the game, such as voting rights, denying legitimacy of political opponents. We hear that on the news every day curtailing opponents' civil liberties, including the media, remember fake news, and tolerating or encouraging violence. And that is in the news very much today. Nearly all the signs are evident today. And the authors conclude, democracy does not necessarily end with a bang, a violent revolution, or by a coup. Rather, and I think this is what we are witnessing, it ends with a whimper, the slow, steady weakening of critical institutions, the vote, elections, the press, and so on. Next. And it's not just the vote. Other democratic institutions are also under attack. Banning books. 39 states have introduced more than 150 bills to ban books on any topic that might make students, quote, unquote, uncomfortable. From 1970 to 2020, the number of daily newspapers fell by 28%, investigative journalists down by 50%. Meanwhile, large media corporations own 80% of all daily newspapers. And not surprisingly, there is less trust in government. In 1960, three quarters of Americans trusted the federal government always or most of the time. Today, it's less than 25% an all time low. Next. Democracy is increasingly at risk in the US, but also abroad. And I mentioned this because we are affected by what's going on around the world. It impacts us. The Economist, a British journal, it, it develops a democracy index and it ranks the US as a flawed democracy and or is sitting between democracy and authoritarianism for the last two or three years. We are behind England and Canada. And over the past 10 years, the number of democratic countries, and this was really startling, fell from 42 to 34, representing only 13% of the world's population. Protect our democracy. 
Even President Biden declared, quote, the longstanding guardrails of US democracy have been shaken. They have placed a dagger at the throat of democracy. Next. So what can social workers do? We are good at diagnosing individual and social problems for sure. Yet we, along with many Americans, are not always ready or comfortable with assessing the status of our democratic institutions. I say we need to up our game. Next. Social workers can and must up our game to help strengthen our democratic institutions. Why? One, it's the right thing to do. It support, two, it supports the profession's missions and social justice values. Three, we are in the right place. We sit at the intersection of the individual and society, whether it's at our desk in an agency or in the community. This makes us best positioned to witness and address the harms brought by a faltering democracy, whether it be poverty, racism, et cetera. And we are well positioned to bring civic participation into the classroom, voter registration into the field, and human rights into the US. Next. So be part of the solution. And as Conoco said, this is, our, this is our slogan for the Power of Three campaign. Imagine if all 700,000 social workers in the US each registered three people to vote and they registered three more and so on. No need to imagine. Join the Power of Three campaign, reg voter registration campaign. Don't mourn organizers. And this is the message we'd like you to send out to everyone in the field. Be part of history, take the Power of Three pledge. And for more information, please go to our website, which information, thanks to Krista, is now in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, who wanted to share, Gary? Yeah. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly for all of you to see. We keep referring to our website. So just a very quick chance for you to see. Um, I went straight to the resources for field education tab, which I also put into the chat. And just for you to see that there is a variety of resource, resources here that um, include activities. Uh, they tie things to the core competencies, articles, materials that you can share at your agencies with, your, with field instructors in case they are interested in learning more about how to include voter registration into the um, agencies directly. So it's very, very practical hands-on tool that um, the field directors education committee, we, we've been putting together a great portion of it done under Beth Lewis while she was chair and um, very, very easy to use for students, field liaisons, facul other faculty agencies, field instructors. So again, that that is in the chat is in the chat, and I will put it in again, um, the website with the direct link to the field education resources. And uh, Krista, back to you. So you know who a few of us are. We want to know who you are. So if you don't mind in the chat, if you can put your name what program you are affiliated with or agency that you're affiliated with and your role, if you don't mind saying there, if you can put that in the chat, kind of give us an idea of who's here with us today. So I get the um, pleasure and opportunity of sharing the story that is copping. Although this is um, primarily a field directed uh, webinar, our, our program today. Um, and Dr. Gary Jones, who is our field director, who is managing the behind the scenes, sent me a um, message or he came into my office. I'm the chairperson for the program and asked me if I would mind supporting him by moderating um, this event and telling them a little bit about the Coppin story because he couldn't be behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. And in good old fashioned Coppin style, I'm here today to support Dr. Jones. Our field and our voter engagement is integrated into our program. So it's appropriate that he and I are here together and doing this together. So Dr. Glenn, Dr. Jones, you can switch the slide. If you don't know Coppin, Coppin is a small HBCU located in Baltimore, Maryland. 
We have a BSW program and we're right in the heart of West Baltimore. So if you are familiar with the story of Freddie Gray and the uprising that happened a few years back, we are literally right in the center of everything that you saw on the news. That is Coppa State University, we're right there. So we are primed for this type of conversation and discussion. We intentionally include civic involvement in our curriculum. We promote programs. I know that the um, pictures on the slides are a little bit small, um, but we had a Senator. Uh, she was not reelected in her reelected campaign, but Barbara Robinson had an intern in her office. And when we had our social work week, sometimes it's social work month, sometimes it's social work day, you never know with us, but typically it's a week long of activities during social work month. Um, she came and did a presentation um, to our students. And then we had a um, council member in Prince George's County, one of our council, councils, one of our counties, Ms. Sharika McCarthy, who we are so excited and proud of because she is a Coppin alum and a former BSW student who also has her master's degree, who is now a current sitting representative. And she also participated in our program. So when we schedule our social work month, week, day, depending on what's happening in the year activities, we always include a civic engagement component uh, to the program. And it really does depend on what we have going on in our field office and amongst our students and alum uh, during the time. We were very excited that particular year that we could have two elected officials, both who happen to be Black women who could come to the campus to talk to our students about whatever the issues uh, were going on at that time. Next slide, please. So engagement is an important piece of what we do at Coppin. Not only do we encourage our students to attend and participate in civic activities, but whenever we have activities on campus, our students often take the lead in those activities. So the one picture is us at the, at the advocacy day that our NASW organizes in our um, state capital in Annapolis. And we went down, a caravan of us uh, to um, the Maryland Capitol and we showed up and students participated. And it's particularly interesting for our undergraduate students because most of the students there from throughout the state are graduate students. So it's a different experience for them that we get to introduce it to them as a part of our undergraduate program. And then the second picture there actually was this past semester. We have our sitting city council president, Nick Mosby came to campus and one of our council members came to campus that the students invited them to come to campus and they hosted a town hall meeting. And just because of the pandemic, we actually were able to have it as a virtual town hall for our entire university. And the students actually gathered the questions, led the questions and myself and the um, policy professor, and another faculty member, we sat in the audience and supported the students and helped guide um, you know, any troubleshooting that they needed. But for the most part, the students really led that town hall meeting and that discussion about all of the issues that are happening in our city. So really getting our students to see the, not only national issues, but the state and local issues that affect them. <laughs> Next slide, Dr. Jones. If you can please mute yourself, make sure everybody checks their mute. And then um, education and workshops. So we actually hello, hello. have a, um, hey, how are you? we actually do have a um, social work student who in 2020 did a voting in social work campaign um, and where she worked with one of our alum, uh, Miss. Deborah Woodford to organize students to become certified to register people to vote. So in the state of Maryland, in order to sign up people to vote, you have to actually get certified in order to do that. We had 24 students voluntarily during the pandemic participate to become voter registration registrars. Um, and then once they were done, they actually did go out into the field and register people to vote. As a department, we provided the support. I was up with them at eight o'clock in the morning for their uh, course. And then um, the students actually went out and we provided them with the support that they needed so that they could do it successfully and safely, safely out in the field because it was during the pandemic. 
Next slide, Dr. Jones. And then community partnerships is an important part of what we do at Coppin. This is uh, Miss Deborah Wolford. She is our alum who comes to campus anytime we call, uh, anytime we ask to help us put together our um, educating the students campaign. She also started her own program called Hip Hop to the Ballot Box Initiative, where she not only works with Coppin, but she works within our community on voter education, um, voter engagement. Um, and so she, using our alum, and our community resources. We've partnered with other field placement agencies. Um, during the pandemic, we sponsored a white party that we co I'm not a white, a watch party, a watch party, where we watch the election results come in with our students and community members through Baltimore Neighbors Network, a virtual watch party. So many different initiatives that we have done to try to engage the students and also our community and get them um, involved. So those are a few of the things that we do as with our students at Coppin State University. The next school that you're going to hear from is St. Leo's University and the presenter is Christina Cavanaugh. She's the field director and she also teaches in the undergraduate social work program. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, my name is Christina Kazanov, and I am the field director and instructor at St. Leo University. St. Leo University is a private Catholic university about 30 minutes north of Tampa, Florida. Next slide, please. I am excited that I have the opportunity to discuss with all of you the work that my undergraduate social work students, faculty, and I work together for voter engagement at our university over the last academic year. I'm pleased to say none of the work we did was without the assistance of voting as social work and the abundance of resources located on their website. Collectively, we utilized the following tools, which was the Why Vote campaign, the Vote ER badges, the Power of Three pledge, and the numerous, numerous resources on vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. So I want to begin with the Why Vote campaign. This was the main component of our voter engagement activities for field. For those who are not familiar, the Why Vote campaign is an eight week advocacy project that ends with a voter registration drive. The campaign comes with a step-by-step -step guide in how students can collaborate with their universities to create a nonpartisan voter registration drive. The campaign is fabulous. It comes with a to-do list full of eight week steps, social media advertisements, steps on how to get volunteers to join, how to ensure you are legally completing a voter registration drive for your state, and how to put on a successful drive. In our field program, all our students are required to make a voter engagement goal under their learning contract for competency three and five. For my traditional aid students who live on campus, our students were able to use the Why Vote campaign and complete the voter engagement drive during social work month. Using the Vote ER badges, which I will discuss next, our students were able to register 76 students, faculty and staff over the course of three days. Next slide, please. Our program also has a high population of non-traditional students who were unable to partner with the Why Vote campaign. To be able to participate and meet their learning contract goals, our non-traditional students utilize the Vote ER badges and the Power of Three pledges. The Vote ER campaign allows clinical staff, medical staff, and social work agencies to utilize TurboVote to assist their clients to register or check their voter registration. The Vote ER Healthy Democracy Toolkit provided our students with a virtual QR code badge, which you see on the screen. It also comes with posters and a telehealth script. Our field students, with permission from their field agencies, put the virtual QR badges on their Zoom backgrounds when conducting telehealth services. 
While completing a biopsychosocial, they would include the question, are you registered to vote or do you need to check your voter registration? If the client said yes or they were unsure, the student walked them through the process of the QR back. Additionally, many of our students were able to incorporate trainings with their agency staff on the Vote ER tool and receive permission to hang the toolkits posters in their agency's waiting room, break rooms, and bathrooms. And to put this into perspective, the posters also come in numerous different languages. Not all of our students were allowed to participate in voter engagement due to agency requests. So for those students, we had them conduct classroom presentations across our interdisciplinary departments of criminal justice, human services, and education. Taking five minutes of class time, the students presented to our university community the Power of Three campaign and concluded using the virtual Vote ER badges. Next slide, please. Additionally, these students helped conduct voter engagement trainings across the university and within their community with partnership of NASW Florida chapter and the local units. For example, during Black History Month, our field students conducted a training on our campus on voter suppression in communities of color, which followed a movie on our lawn at our university. And the movie was all, all in the fight for democracy, which followed the work of Stacey Abrams fight for voter registration in Georgia. This was a really well attended and supported event. And we partnered with our black student union, our social work club and our student government union. Additionally, the students partnered with our locally League of Women Voters to help with the voter drive. And this month, our field students are completing a training on transgender voting rights for Pride Month in partnership with a local health facility that is known for their support of the LGBTQIA community. Many of these efforts were really easy to implement. It allowed our students to build their civic character and civic engagement, and it truly participated in their advocacy efforts. Even though we are a private institution in a red state, our students were able to utilize nonpartisan tools to bring attention to, to the need for voter engagement. And I'm excited to continue this work as we gear up starting in August with a Get Out the Vote campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Our next um, pres presenter is actually a group of presenters. It is the Missouri Kansas City story. And our uh, presenters will be um, Adriana Pius, all the names here, Miss Emily Harris, and Miss Devonna Williams. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Unfortunately, uh, Devana is not able to join us today, but I do have Emily here. And while you get started, for people that are asking about the PowerPoint, if you put your view on gallery view, you should be able to see the speakers in the PowerPoint. Hopefully that'll help. Um, technically you. speaker view. Not speaker view, I'm sorry. Thank you, not gallery view. Okay, hello everyone. I'm excited to be here. My name is Adriana Paez. I am um, the outgoing um, field coordinator and assistant teaching professor at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And I'm so excited to have Emily Harris, MSW here. She just graduated this summer. And I'm excited to uh, bring a student story, a student experience to this conversation because that is uh, something that really has inspired me in this past year of implementing voter engagement work um, through our program, our MSW program here at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Um, so really, I just, uh, I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna let Emily do most of the talking here. I really want her to share um, kind of her process and experience through um, what we did in this past year, which was new to our program. So I have a whole story of ways that I've reflected on uh, my own experience as a student and 
Um, there were a lot of reasons why I uh, felt really energized and activated and motivated to um, bring this campaign, bring this work to our program and allow our students to um, have these experiences, practice um, this type of engagement out in the community um, and be just be more um, familiar with why voting is important and why that should matter to every single social worker. Um, so um, what we did last year was we implemented um, directly into the field, but also we did a couple of curriculum um, additions too. But um, again, that we're gonna focus on what happened in the field. Um, and so in my role as field coordinator, I was really fortunate to have a really supportive um, department that said, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's do this. Let's implement um, some requirements for our, our field students. Um, and so we had them do two voter engagement related activities of their choice. Um, so they were to get into their, their practicum agency, um, kind of look around, see what was going on already, and then come up with two ways that they could implement and practice voter engagement at their field site. Um, so I want to just give a quick shout out to Dr. Uh, Christy Law at St. Ambrose University. She was actually the person, the colleague that um, I got connected with who really supported me in getting our program, um, getting all of this going in um, the, the fall of last year. So a uh, shout out to her and, and the mentorship um, has been really helpful in um, doing this work. And so I am always really excited to meet new people that are really excited about voter engagement, voter mobilization. And I believe Emily is one of those people um, now too, that we can, every time we talk about it, it's, we're both just like, yes, this is so important. So um, without further ado, I am going to um, ask Emily to um, speak on um, kind of the, the first step in the process when, so Emily was a uh, second year student in our MSW program this past year, her first year here in field, there was no requirement. And so we announced, you know, this will be something that'll be new this year. Um, and we had kind of talked about her initial response to that and some of the reactions that she was hearing from other students. So um, yeah, what, tell us what you thought, Emily, when we first uh, introduced this new initiative into the field program. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I started grad school in 2020 pandemic, right? Um, so it's already a handful of things going on and to maneuver and process and you're learning all brand new things. Um, so first year of uh, field, we were just like, so hyped, so ready to get out there and like practice what we were going over and um, practicing in the classroom. And then second year comes and we're like, okay, yeah, we're getting adjusted. We know the drill. We know how to do this a little bit more confidence um, and then we get surprised with a new requirement and it was you know this voter engagement piece and um, I kind of I think the collective was like oh no like another requirement like you've got to be kidding me right um, what more could we put on our plates like how do we fit this all in and I think it was just more um it was more hyped up than what we, you know, once we got in and we got into the work and in our agencies and started having conversations, um, it just made sense. It kind of just went along with it, especially um, all of the elections that happened throughout the year or different years. Um, so I think at first initial, we were like, oh, no, this is too much. And really getting into it, if you had a supportive environment, and I was so lucky to have such an amazing supervisor in my field and my placement. And she was so ready to encourage me to go above and beyond anywhere that I wanted to think and go and just brainstorm an idea. She was like, yes, I support you. Go figure it out. Go try it. Um, and I think that was just so easy to just transition into because, um, you know, whatever work you, you were in, in your field placement, um, they were like, here's kind of like what we're doing. So I could like match it up alongside that. Um, so where I was, was kind of more of a, a macro social work um, experience. And they were wanting to start a houseless task force here in Kansas City, um, not along with the city, but just like along with their other like um, neighborhood association group. And so they were like, hey, if you want to tag along with the house, you know, the houseless task force, 
um, and then maybe drive your voter engagement piece around those who um, are experiencing houselessness, um, go ahead, right ahead, just like start thinking of things. And I think um, that little bit of like guidance was really helpful because uh, since it was new to everybody, we really kind of didn't know where to go, how to start. Um, but that little bit of like, here's a little piece of the field that you should take, break off, and then just kind of like go run with it. Um, and I honestly came from a background like my mom was super supportive of like social work and my education and like was always pushing me to vote as soon as I was of age to go register I was down at one of the lo local public libraries I was registering to vote we talked about it every election we drove together to our placements every single election and it was just always like I was raised in an environment where that was that was just a known thing you just do you use your right you use your voice um so I really um was I think a lot a lot of it was a little bit of ignorance um, to think that I was like voting. I know everything I need to know about voting. Like, why do I need to focus on this? You know, I don't know how to do client referrals. I don't know how to do rapport. I don't know how to do these jobs in social work, but I know about voting, right? Um, so I think it was a little bit discouraging, like going in and doing some of the extra research until I started figuring out I did not know as much as I thought I did. And I, it's, it was not talked about it enough. I was my second year and I was hit with so many surprises on things um, around voting, like the voter ID restrictions. And um, the biggest one for me, especially delving into working with um, the houseless population, was that it was such common knowledge of oh, you know, once you get a felony on your record, uh, you can't vote again, right? Your voting restriction is, I mean, it's just off the table. Um, that's it. And really, that's not true. Um, it's different state to state. But here in Missouri, um, that is just simply not true. Once you have finished probation and parole and your, um, your charge wasn't against, like, interfering with any kind of voting, um, you are allowed to get your votes right. I mean, it's just and it's just automatically restored. And so many people that I was talking to, on top of their other barriers, they didn't even know they had a shot. They didn't even know they needed or should be trying to get their IDs. I was talking to fellow students, fellow teachers, my supervisor at my field placement, and nobody knew this to be true. And I'm like, I am a second year MSW student. And I'm talking to people across the board of in our profession, teachers, fellow students, students who have gotten other degrees in other areas, and nobody knew about this. And it's just put as common knowledge. And it's just, it's not true. Um, so it really got me passionate and hyped up on like, what do we need to do? How do we need to do this? Um, next step was to go into the field and just figure out what's going on, what's out there, because I think I had a little bit too much trust um, and that those around me and agencies around me were figuring it out and we're just doing it. Um, but when you start looking at those like micro experiences and putting yourself through those barriers and like walking myself through these steps and these barriers specifically for those who are unhoused um, to get an ID, which is registering is number one, sure, but what comes after that? Um, it's making sure you have your voter ID card. It's making sure that you have um, transportation to get to your polling site. Do you know what it means, like what's on the ballot? Do you know how to read into that and understand what you and your voice and your choice is saying? Um, so for then it just kept snowballing. And I'm like, you know, everyone's going to just register people to vote, but what do I need to do? What do I need to do more? What do I need to do next? I need to make this profound. Um, and so I really, um, I started trying to look into maybe opening like a mailbox at my agency um, to have like those people can just come in and see their mail. I talked to several um, houseless agencies, you know, those who are like one-stop shop areas um, for those who need resources. And only one in the Kansas City area had an open mail room that you didn't need to ha have a residence at to obtain and to keep your mail and get all of your stuff at. Um, so it was just, I was snowballing all of these effects and all these things that I had no idea I needed to learn. 
And my passion just grew and grew and grew. I ended up doing my entire capstone around the barriers, specifically looking in Kansas City and what more that we need to be doing as social workers and in our agencies. And I think um, a lot with our, like my fellow students, we just didn't know what we needed to know until we were put through it. So I felt like I had a good amount of knowledge, um, especially compared to a lot of other people and a lot of other students that I was around. Um, and it still just wasn't even cutting it. And I had no idea. And I'm just so thankful that I had to be put through these steps and I put myself through these um, barriers. And so I know what needs to be done and what needs to be opened up in the field. Um, so I consider myself um, pretty fairly educated. And this was the next step I needed, the push that I needed to take this further, for sure. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. I just, like I said, um, I'm sure it's clear to our audience just how passionate and just really energized um, Emily is about this work and, and understanding it at a deeper level because like she explained, she was going through all of those steps um, um, along with the, you know, the, the community members. Um, I just, so many things um, it makes that so exciting to me, like the connection to the community, the, the community engagement piece that is so important um, and the ways that, that this work connects to literally everything else that we are doing. Um, and I think it, it, it connects to that, those macro issues of the systemic issues, systemic barriers um, that limit you know, individuals in our communities to be able to have their basic needs met. Um, to have their voices heard and recognized. Um, so I want to um, switch to, I want you to share with the audience, Emily, all of the, the, the work that you did and how that work is going to continue at both your practicum site and your current job site. So that is another thing that's really, you know, I'm so excited to hear your passion for this work because I know it's going to continue. And I know that you are leaving a piece of that work with your field site. And so other, you know, individuals, other students are going to be able to benefit from that work that you put in. So please share us, share with us um, what, what work will continue on. Yeah, of course. Um, so I know I had shared initially that like, um, I really didn't want to do <laughs> the basic, like, um, just signing people up to vote, right? Because I wanted to make sure that that was continued. Like, I just didn't feel like that was enough, especially learning more and more about the barriers. I was just like, I can't just like halfway it and just go halfway and just never know if it's even going to amount to anything. Um, my first attempt was to open a mail room, um, like a community mail room that like those in the community who didn't have an address, a home address or a safe address that they can um, just kind of sign up and get their mail there. Um, I really wanted to open up at my agency and my field supervisor was just all for it. Oh, she was just so excited. And it I did so much research on the one that was in Kansas City and talked to so many people about it. And it was like, it all but needed a full staff and some extra money and an extra space. And we just didn't have that in the agency where it was right then. Um, but really she had me like write out my whole plan, my whole ideas, all the stuff that I collected about it and information from those working at that agency, put it collectively together so they can like um, have it for future reference when they want to or can open up their own mailroom. So they are putting it in their renovation plans or putting it in their future plans and want to continue to talk to other students about it. Um, so I did ended up <laughs> hosting a voter registration event, two of them actually at the one-stop shop um, place here in Kansas City that had the mailroom um, that specifically works with um, those who are unhoused. And um, they were absolutely wonderful. They host like fairs where all agencies can come table together and share their resources and help sign people up. Um, I think it's like the second Wednesday of every month here. And so I ended up partnering with them so we could specifically use their mailroom and their services because um, there were other places there that could help with signing up for IDs and sign up um, for medical care and all that stuff. So they, for one, didn't have to sacrifice going to get other resources where they needed it. I came to them where this hub was. 
Two, they had their mailroom that beyond this, they can use it for every single thing that they need, pay stubs, stuff for getting their ID, et cetera, and food. Um, so we signed them up. I got over um, 50 people in two different um, uh, sessions, two different events signed up. Um, and we just talked about it. I had so many flyers made and I told them, I told so many people about, Hey, you know, if you are off probation and parole, did you know you can vote again? Did you know that you're right? Um, did you know you have those rights back? And so many people didn't know. And they were calling their friends or their partners and saying, I'm going to have them come up and register with you now because we've been wanting to for five, 10 years now. And it was just amazing to see. Um, so I would send people to two tables down to get their IDs after they filled something out or before they did. And they knew where to go get them afterwards. We had sheets explaining what was going to be on the upcoming ballots um, and really just pushing it forward and showing how important and how like this demographic and this population wants to talk about this. Yes, they have other pressing needs. Yes, it should be taken care of first, but they wanted to talk about this. They wanted their right. They wanted to say something. They want these services. Um, so it was incredible. And I think it showed a lot of people around me and in my field and even at this agency that like, oh, this is important. Oh, you're, you're getting a lot of feedback. You're getting a lot of people who are talking to you about this and wanting conversation, wanting more and signing up. I had even like vendors, people at the other tables come over and say, you know what? I need to register or I need to change my address. Um, so we were just talking to everyone and anyone. And I think that brought so much awareness just to that agency or those there. And um, I think a lot of people want to dismiss um, those who are unhoused um, because the society makes it impossible for them to think about anything but their basic needs. Um, but at the same time, we should still talk with people about their right to vote. Um, so yeah, I hope that it gets continued. Um, I also, at my place of work, um, I was hired on from my first year um, placement agency. And so I had students, fellow students there too, who wanted to do something. So we ended up making a class together because I, I teach there. Um, I teach soft skills. So I said, hey, why don't you put together a class? We'll do it together. And then once you finish that class, I can put that in my curriculum and carry it on. So now every cohort of students goes through a voter education class and we have time to sign up for voting so all of my clients get to do so now um, so it has been fabulous I mean in the two places that I have seen this first go around of this program at UMKC um, we've affected so many people and I just get to talk to so many people about it and I just didn't know how passionate I was um, and how much this how much more this needs to be talked about so it was incredible Wow, Emily and Adriana, y'all have like started the fire um, in the chat. So many people, first of all, congratulations on completing your degree requirements for the MSW, Emily. Welcome to social work officially. Um, and you, somebody even looked up in Louisiana that they found out just effectively 2122. What you said about being paroled or on probation is now true in Louisiana. So hopefully more people will look it up because we have these assumptions that we just pass on and policy changes, right? Which is why we love policy so much. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those stories. Don't go away because we wanna give everybody in the chat an opportunity to ask questions of any of the panelists or any of the voting in social work um, members that we have here. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Right at about 2, 10-ish or so, we're going to break out into groups because we do want to hear from each other in groups, kind of what are some of the initiatives that people have going on. When you get into your group, if you start the chat and one of us pops in, uh, don't, don't, feel, don't hesitate to start without us, but we are uh, coming to the group. But it is our opportunity to kind of get to chat. So are there any questions that anybody had? Um, you saw some different models of organized um, course curriculum where it's infused into the curriculum as assignments through field or through the curriculum, and then other programs that have it as activities that are either specific to the social work program or throughout the university. We got a very informative. Are there any questions? Panelists. Are there, is there anybody with any follow-up thoughts or comments that they wanted to um, add? 
Did anybody have anything that they wanted to add? Uh, one of the things that I wanted to add is from the links, you know, again, not fully being aware about all of the resources that is voting in social work, because when I started teaching policy, that wasn't a resource. I went to some of the other resources that are now attached to that uh, website. And one of the activities that I do with all of my students when I teach the policy classes, they have to do that assignment where they figure out who their legislators are and who their representatives are. And like Emily said, they all complain about it but I won't help them at all. And if you knew how difficult it was for people to find out who their representatives are, it's a very difficult assignment for most students to get through. And so we actually take a whole class and the assignment to really help people figure out who their representatives are. And then we talk about it in the context of our populations that we serve them. If it's hard for us and we are educated folks, then imagine how it is just for the everyday person that's trying to work and manage a life to figure out who all these people are and what they do. So Emily, this question is for you. They heard you share an experience of a supportive placement agency. Um, and so I guess the field directors can also answer this or field agents, field um, directors. How do um, you as a field director support students when their agency is not supportive? So some a placement that might be different from what um, Emily had, how do you support that? One of the field directors wanna take that question. Ruth, Adriana, since you are leaving out of the role soon, how did you handle it for students who did not have a supportive placement? So I'll be honest, um, I, we didn't hear a whole lot about, about um, difficulties um, at their sites. I know that uh, it sounds like there were some students that maybe were talking amongst themselves. Um, um, but, you know, if if we had a student that um, had expressed, expressed some, some difficulty, I think, again, like Emily said, just the supportive, you know, being supportive of what they're trying to do and also helping. Um, I think there's a, a wide range of, of activities, of things that you can do, um, of course, that are all nonpartisan. This is all nonpartisan. And I think uh, an important part for just another thing that Emily pointed out was that there's a lot of um, myths out there about what, you know, nonprofits can and cannot do. Um, so, you know, I would have, I would have encouraged students to educate, um, you know, individuals at their site about, you know, what is, um, doable and what's not, um, because I think that there are a lot of, there's, there's just a lot of, um, lack of education around, you know, what can and cannot be done. And, and in such a, you know, politicized time, um, it's, it's easy to get, you know, um, uh, to have a little fear about, you know, venturing into something like voter engagement and mobilization, voter registration, um, so yeah, I think that the education piece is, is so is such an important part to um, yeah to combat all of the the misinformation and and myths about this work that are that is out there. Mm -hmm. And we had a suggestion in the chat that said that they that students could. Um, set up registration tables. They gave an example at food pantries at, at places that are not only their internships, but in other places. Uh, Ruth, were you about to say something? Got to yeah. take yourself off of mute. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that um, we, we, we allocate to our students a certain number of field hours for various activities. And one of them was around voting and civic engagement. So in, you know, work like if you worked at a polling place um, or if you got involved in certain activities you you could get a, a certain number of field hours so it wasn't um, you know for the students that's that's a big motivator <laughs> it's like alternative ways to to accumulate field hours in addition to going to their internship and and so that um, it, it's not specifically going to another place, but giving them opportunities and helping to connect them to places where they could make this effort, but and then give get credit, um, tangible credit is, is another way that this can be accomplished, that students will will feel um, 
that they can find their busy time in their busy lives. Like, okay, I can actually get credit for this. Um, I might actually do some of these extra things, even if I can't do it at my agency. That's just one way we do it. One more thing real quick that just popped into my head. Uh, we did, you know, thinking about the, uh, I really dug into how are colleges and universities, um, you know, promoting voter engagement, voter registration on campus. And it, they're very lacking in that area, I have to say. And so one of the things that we did was um, we are through our student organization, um, we did voter engagement on our campus, voter registration. So uh, we were also simultaneously doing a collaborative research study with St. Ambrose University's um, program as well. And so that was something that we opened up to all of our students, not just our field students. Um, and so I think providing some on-campus opportunities for students to practice that might, you know, be experiencing some kind of barrier at their field site um, could be also another avenue to allow students to engage and, and practice. Um, and then just to add outside of field education, um, we have a, and I think most schools have a policy course, a macro course. And so one, there's various assignments that they have that they can complete ones like writing an editorial. Um, another is like doing an advocacy effort. So doing voter registration could be an acceptable assignment for a course like that. So even if it's not in directly field education, it's in the curriculum and, uh, and on the mac on some of the policy macro side of the curriculum. So again, a lot, um, you know, the students are really overwhelmed. They feel really burdened. So we try to find ways that reward them academically for, for doing this work. That, that seems to resonate. <laughs> Well, it, I think it's time to start with the breakout groups, unless anybody has any final thought that they wanted to say during this. There's some great ideas in the chat. Everyone is rejoining the room. Welcome back. Hopefully you made some connections and got some ideas and some feedback and was able to reflect on a few things that you are able to take away. Um, we have about three good minutes to wrap up. And so I just wanted to um, ask Mimi, Conoco, Julie, is there any last minute details that you wanted to um, discuss. We do want to ask everybody to please get more information from the resources shared online about voting and social work, the field resources, and the um, initiative to register three people to vote. Anything else? Well, I just, I mean, I can, we've spent a lot of time updating, upgrading that website and it's, it's gotten, we've gotten a lot of compliments on it. You've been introduced to it already several times, but I really recommend you just go browse through it because it, you'll find things for faculty, for students, for field, but you'll also find generic things. There's something called a generic flyer that deals with the myths and barriers that deals with the benefits. And, and then there are all these tools I mean, the, you heard about the voter, uh, the vote, why vote campaign. That's a, a fabulous resource. If you want to have someone organize the whole campaign for you, you could use it all or in part. And there are tools that you can just take into your classroom, into the field, into the agencies, and it, let students see. Um, we've seen what a creative student Emily was, and we can see what what students can do with if given an opportunity. So. Um, I don't know. I, I just want to thank you all. Thank everybody for being here and, and, and Gary and uh, Christopher for, the, for their leadership in this, uh, in this webinar, because I think it was, it, it's met all our expectations and even more, you know, when you organize one of these things, you worry till the end. So I'm no longer, I stopped worrying a long time ago since we got started because it's really gone so well. So thank you. Anybody else? Ruth, you wanted to say any last closing words? Kanako, any last closing words? Kanako? Yes, well, uh, I just want to thank you for the amazing um, speakers and also moderator. And I would like to give a big shout out to Ruth 
for her leadership and then also all the organizing and then also Gary, thank you so much for uh, being a, a back, our backbone. And it's, I learned a lot from all of you today. Uh, and I also, Ruth, you mentioned that uh, some states have a new regulation to limit voters, right? So it seems like our effort has a moving target. And uh, I, I'm just so grateful for your joining us. And please join our group. Ruth? No, just thank you so much to the presenters, to our moderator, to Gary, who like was that behind the scenes wizard for us and Mimi for speaking and all of our supporters. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, you know, again, we put our website in there for the resources. Uh, there's other resources that were in the chat. We'll definitely have this recorded. Um, our emails are there. If somebody's like, oh, I really want to get started, but I don't know how and you want to just ask, please follow up. And we're, we're always interested in, in, it's not a closed committee, the field education committee. So if somebody really wants to get even more involved, please reach out and um, see about joining with us on the field education committee. It's a great committee. I, I sit in on it. It's a great committee. So you should definitely think about joining. <laughs> We are at our 2.30 time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. And if you're having a great summer break, enjoy the break. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.